Tonight's Getaways is here at the later time of 8.30 on BBC One Northern Ireland after a special edition of The One Show, paying tribute to the life of a legend, a man absolutely loved by millions, Sir Terry Wogan. So what better time to celebrate the man who spent 50 years entertaining us on television and radio? Yes, this was Sir Terry Wogan's slot and we are proud to be sharing it with him tonight. So for the next hour, we are going to be... We're going to be taking things slowly. Very slowly. Aren't we? Are because that's exactly what he would have done. And we will be revelling in his work and in his wit. Now, joining us are people who were lucky enough to work with him, our friend Chris Evans, who had the very daunting task of taking over his radio show. We also have Graham Norton with us tonight, who followed in his footsteps from Ireland to Eurovision. Alan Dedicote and Lynn Bowles, his on-air wingman and woman, <laughs> who bantered away many a morning together. Yes, and later Sue Cook, who presented Children in Need alongside Sir Terry for 11 years. So, welcome to you all. It's lovely yeah. to see you. It's a shame on, on such a sad day, but what a collection of yeah. people we have. And I know, Chris, that you would have been absolutely knocked sideways by the news yesterday morning. Where were you and, and when did you hear the news of Sir Terry's passing then? I woke up um, yesterday morning to a message from our boss at Radio 2, Bob Shannon, and he said, it was a voice message, he called me earlier on. I was asleep for once in the morning. And um, he said, can you please call me back very urgently, there's something you need to know. And so... Um, so I called him back and he told me. It's quite a past eight. With that, I mean, so many memories must just flash before you. And, I mean, if there was one... I mean, we're going to be talking for an hour all about this, mm. so don't feel the pressure at all, but <laughs> if, there is, if there's one kind of vivid memory that you have of Sir Terry, what would that be? And Chris, we'll, we'll start with you. There are so many. I mean, and today, you know, the last 24 hours have taught me more about life than the last 24 years. Uh -huh. uh, it, and, you know, I knew Terry relatively well. Graham knew him well, deadly, and then knew him better than we did. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, the first time I met him was 25 years ago-ish. And um, straight away, he was so welcoming to me. You know, he took me under his wing, and I didn't deserve it at the time. You know, I was a bit... I was an idiot, as he would wayward. say. Wayward. <laughs> yeah, wayward, to say the least. And, um, mm -hmm. and he was so nice to me. He invited, when I was on Radio 1, he was on Radio 2, he invited me over to, um, to, to his studio to break the bread, and then very quickly after that, he said, look, we do wake up half the nation every morning. Um, why don't we get together one day and chat about that a bit? So he invited me to go and have a game of golf with him which was brilliant to play golf with Terry Wogan. <laughs> the man who responsible still holds the record for the longest the ever longest televised putt. Yeah, yeah. Which he, I know I think was his proudest um, professional <laughs> I'm achievement. I'm surprised. Other I mean, than it's quite something, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, and so I went over to his house, which was just... You know when you, you imagine somebody's house and yeah. it's never like you want it to be? This was exactly oh, like really? I wanted it. Big gates, cr crunching Terry gravel. Towers, right? Terry Towers. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you've been? No, no, okay. no. OK. And um, it, absolutely gorgeous. And I'm, I'm thinking, OK, I must play well today. But, of course, we weren't going to play golf straight away because we were going to have lunch. And before lunch, we were going to have a drink. And we, he opened a bottle of pink champagne at 11 o'clock in the morning. Ooh. And I thought, oh, here we go. Um, within an hour, that, that had gone. And then Lady Helen had prepared a lunch, uh, pre-prepared lunch, because she was off to play bridge with her pals that afternoon. Again, perfect. And, um, and we had lunch. We finished lunch about 2 or 3 which point I couldn't even remember the game of golf had ever been invented. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we, we went and had a game of golf. And, oh. um, and uh, we, got to, I, we got to the 11th hole out of 18. He said, he said I think Christy, you used to call me Christy, Christy, I think we better wrap it up after this one. I said, yeah, because it's getting dark, isn't it? He said, no, no, we've got dinner booked at 7 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and so he took us to this Italian restaurant. I mean, I, I can't believe I can remember this much of the day. And then it got to about half 10, and we both had to be able to do our shows the next day. I said, Terry, did, I think we'd better go now, you know. And I wasn't one for calling an early night, you know, especially at that time. He said, why, Christy, why, what's the matter now? <laughs> and I said, um, I said well, you know, we've got to get ready to prepare our shows. He said, geez, what time do you get up? I said, uh, half four. He said, you're not until half six. He said, what's that for then? I said, well, the preparation, you know. He said, mm. Christy, they either like you or they don't. 
Oh, and, and that was the, yeah. and that was wow. that was yeah. the best yeah, yeah, yeah. thing I'd probably ever heard mm. about broadcast, and ever since. But um, the last twenty four hours have been incredible because the more you think about how he was, the more you f you sort of realise that you didn't didn't observe that at the mm. time. He always had time mm. time for people after the show, time for his pals, time for the team, yes. and time on the radio and time on telly, like you said. That's right. Yeah. And it, it, that's why he could be so funny because he gave himself time to think of things yeah, and listen yeah. to things yeah. and orchestrate and use that wit, that vocabulary that he had. How about you, Graham? Well, that's, I must say, I love that Sir Terry Wogan was the one leading you astray. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but it's, uh, for me, it's just about how funny he was. I, I just remember just, he, just laughing like a drain. Uh, when he used to do like his, his uh, roundups of the Dallas, what had happened in Dallas Aww. the night before, or you know the Janet and John yes, stories, um, and, and that thing you were saying too, the things you didn't appreciate fully at the time, like the way he used language, the words he would use. Like we'd never heard the word ginormous before he <laughs> said it. You know, I'm sure I don't know whether That's it existed right. or not. But, no, yeah. Yeah. but he, was, he was very well read, wasn't he? That yeah, was no, he was incredible. Yeah. Like his vocabulary yeah. so always, was immense. So weirdly, always prepared in that way because yeah. he knew where he kind of wanted yeah. to take things and what have you and so he was prepared in his own way even though it looked like maybe he didn't want to do a lot of prep but we also want viewers help tonight don't we all we do now this is your one show so if you ever met sir terry please share your pictures of you and him together we'd love to see them send them into the usual address and we'll show some a bit later won't we? now as well as everything else of course sir terry made uh, many television documentaries one of the most recent uh, was when he toured the uk in a black cab in search of the best British food. His driver was Mason McQueen and he was out and about early this morning in search of more memories of the great man. So first stop memory line, Esther, and your fondest memories of Sir Terry? It's the first night of the first Children in Need. We were facing 10 hours of live television and autocue broke. It could have been a disaster with anyone else, but of course Terry, as you know, loved unscripted, he loved mistakes, and we just bantered. There was no feeling of fear on my part, because I had, you know, unflappable T. Wogan next to me. When I first met him, I came home, and my wife said, you're talking like Terry Wogan. <laughs> I went, am I? <laughs> like this slight Irish lilt, you know? I said, I've just been round him all day, he just has this effect on you. I remember him, one interview he did on, he was a guest on Top Gear, and he, you just realised how sharp he was, how brilliant, he was so funny. I wasn't going all out. You, <laughs> you can say that again. He could have been a stand-up comedian, definitely. I don't normally get affected by this sort of news, you know, obviously you hear a celebrity's passing, but this time it's, it's quite, it has been quite depressing. Tell us all you know about Mr T. The mornings in the radio studio, listening to him, you'd laugh anyway, but when you talk to him off air, you would end up helpless with laughter sometimes. It was just, it's a fantastic way to start a day, either as a listener or as a colleague. You know, it was how many people get to laugh first thing in the morning as part of their work. And we did, it was fantastic fun. Whenever I think about him, I just smile. You know, yeah, you exactly can't help that. it. You exactly. Help it. And that's how he'd want us now. Oh yeah, well I used to watch that uh, program, um, you know, blankety blank, checkbook and pen. We uh, didn't get television until later on in our teenage years where we came from, but yeah. blankety blank was the big one there. My mother lived for that show. <laughs> you know, you'd be proud to be seeing an Irishman <laughs> making it over here and doing well, and everybody seemed to love him. You're a fan of Terry Wogan? Of course, I've been a, a fan of his for years. And I like Eurovision, but I like tuning into it to see what Terry says. This is my favourite bit now, because I was reared on diddly die music. When somebody's silly on, or not very good, to hear what Terry would say about it. <laughs> This'll win. How are you? Are you all right? Oh, sad. Yeah. It's, it's like that, isn't it? But he won't want us to be sad, Gabby, no. you know that. No, I know. I did my radio show yesterday and everyone was saying, how could you do it? And I said, well, because uh, if Terry was there, he'd kick me up the bottom and say, what do you think you're doing? Just entertain. That's what you're there to do, entertain. Yeah, he didn't take it too serious, did he, Gabby? No, but the, the only thing he took seriously was his love of his family. And I think everybody's yeah. talking about 
their wonderful memories of him and everything and people who knew him and worked with him. But it's his family. My heart's breaking for the family and he adored his family. They came first. Helen and the kids came first. <clears throat> yeah, it, you know what? It's so many people are saying how they feel, but we forget that the family yeah, are at yeah. the core of it, aren't mm, they? And really mm, going, you know, really going through yeah, it of at course. a time like that. And everybody feels so much shock, you know, right across the nation. You can't, you, you, can't, mm. you really can't imagine. But uh, Alan, let's let, let's have a word about how you ended up working with with Sir Terry because you read the news. Was it fifteen years you did it? Yeah, more than fifteen years. Right. I and gave how did to that, that connection start? Then? <laughs> what? Uh, well, it just it was just because uh, we had a team of about ten, and we wanted whittled down to just a few so that we could build up a, a bond a relationship with him. Yes. And my one of my favourite stories of the great man, following on from what Chris was saying, was on one occasion I did get invited to the house, and it is a lovely place. <laughs> nice gaff. <laughs> nice gaff. And we were going to the Medeski Stadium in Reading to watch rugby. Now, I am to rugby what Gracie Fields was to spot welding. <laughs> and so <laughs> I sort of went along anyway, and my, my aim was to hoover up all the food generally. But I was, I was standing in his lounge, and it was a, it's a lovely house, but very lived in, because he'd raised kids there. Right. All the rest of it. Uh, and so I was looking down the garden, it was a wet, miserable Saturday morning, and I remember th sort of seeing this grey object at the far end of the garden. And I said to Terry, I said, what's that down there? Is it some sort of Wendy house or tree house for the kids? He sort of leaned over and said, it's Windsor Castle. <laughs> <laughs> His house backs onto Windsor Castle. Now, Wind, Windsor Castle backs, backs onto Windsor Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but he was sort of by royal appointment anyway, because the Queen did listen, and she did invite him to dinner yeah. every now and again, yeah. which was just lovely. It's just right. around the corner as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could walk to home. Exactly. Yeah. And, Lynn, you joined up a little bit later Yeah, I was Alan. about the last five years with you guys yeah, yeah, on absolutely. air. Yeah. I've been five years behind the yeah. scenes, but yeah. um, I think Terry was never one to prepare. I, I, this is going to come through, I feel, <laughs> in this show. Well, he knew the word rehearsal, but he didn't know how to spell it quite, or indeed to put it into operation. He used to say, what was it? Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And then pull back. Pull back. But he always pulled back. <laughs> yeah, we didn't really do the rehearsal, rehearsal. Forget the rehearsal, forget the rehearsal. You know, you do traffic and travel, and lots of people would be very excited to see you in the flesh, I'm sure, this evening. But you were They're very... obviously crackers. <laughs> <laughs> but you worked closely with Terry, you were closely with Chris and Ken, and presumably there's a sort of a different atmosphere, a different vibe, for each one of the three. You know, Chris, obviously horrendous every morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Awful. You don't know how much I suffer, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's very you difficult. You scrub up so well. Yes, I scrub How, um, how was Ken, Terry then? Well, Ken is obviously my radio husband. Yeah. But um, Wogan, Terry Wogan was just fantastic. He was just the best guy you could ever work with. Mm. He was kind and generous. He was generous to a fault as a broadcaster. Not all broadcasters are, you'll be surprised to learn. Um, but he, <laughs> he um, if I said a clever thing to get us to finish mm. a little kind of skit, he'd let me have it. He mm. didn't need to top me because he just wanted everyone to have a good time and if that finished it, fine, yeah. we'll move on. You know, you can't say fairer than that. But even that intonation that he had, that's so infectious, isn't it? When yeah. you're talking to him, you can't help but get on to kind of that flow in yeah, the yeah, way yeah. that he is. And, oh, beautiful you know, voice. Beautiful that voice. flow beautiful of tempo. But you were, never, with... you were never worried about him being a big star because mm. he never treated no. anyone like that. He was just a good bloke, wasn't he? Mm. Yeah. And I, th I think he... That's kind of... You sort of forget that he was the first guy who presented in that way, in that yes. incredibly relaxed, yeah. laid-back laid way. Back, yeah. The sort of thing that everyone aspires to to do now. Mm -hmm. But he kind of, he, I think he came up with that, the idea of just being that. He always sounded like he was wearing a cardigan, not a suit. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, mm -hmm. he's just yeah, so yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember, he is actually the first and only person that I've ever been starstruck with. And I remember when I was doing an interview Aww. with him on Blue Peter, and I remember seeing him through the window, I went to Radio 2, and I couldn't actually believe that it was him there. <laughs> and I thought, and, and he just made me, like you were saying, Chris, you know, he made me feel so at ease, and I thought, if mm. I can get through this, I can talk to anybody. And he was just so magical, yeah. and he said, look, I'll stay till the end of your film, and don't worry, all the bits you need to do, I'm here for you, don't you worry. But it was that, that relaxed was thing, yeah. because yeah. he knew that if, if he was relaxed, the show yeah. was relaxed, mm. and mm. listeners and viewers, there's nothing like they like more in entertainment television than, than a relaxed watch than or a relaxed yeah. Yeah. It really yeah. works, and it really communicates. And, and that was it. That, the, Graham's right, he originated that, and because he was sort of half a decade older than the Radio 1 lot when they started, so in 67, he was five or six years yeah, older. He was, yeah, he was yeah. almost a generation older, so he was never really a disc jockey. 
he was something else, more of an observer, really. And, and the thing about, about Terry is he, he, he was intelligent and disc jockeys aren't, we're simpletons, you know, that's, that's the deal. <laughs> so he makes us sound even more stupid uh, with his wit. And we were saying, you know, if we, if we could have 10, most of us, if we could have 10% of what he had, we'd be 100% better. Yeah. He was yeah. just on a different yeah. level. Yeah. Well, you know, at RTE, good. he was an announcer and a newsreader as well. He was taken and very teacher. seriously mm. and a teacher. Mm. He taught people to present. He yeah, was, absolutely. That was amazing. Well, uh, Terry once said, my opinion has the weight of a ton of feathers, but of course he meant that to be taken with a huge pinch of salt. <laughs> yeah, and seconding Chris there, nobody knew more than him about what made great radio. He started at the BBC in 1967 after making his name in Ireland. At its peak, Wake Up to Wogan had 8.1 million listeners. Although he always said he only ever had one. BBC Radio 2 Terry Wogan The most important programme on any radio network is the morning show, is the breakfast show. It identifies the network and it's at the time when people are more susceptible or more receptive, if you like, uh, to what's going on. Uh, She's going to be singing live for us. Yeah. And so you have to reflect, I think, what they're actually looking at or what they're listening to or what they're involved with. We can Ten seconds, Terry. You're better off listening to Radio 2. You don't hear that one very often, do you, Debbie? Oh, sorry to talk to you when you might listen. <laughs> do, do, uh, don't let that was interrupt your eating. I love radio because I can impose my own pausing on it. I can impose my own timing on it. Uh, and because people think while they're listening to the radio. Uh, television is Stu's thought. Your thinking is done for you, your imagination is done for you. And um, you can't really pause too much, otherwise the director will take the camera off you. There you are, Keats on casters or Wordsworth on wheels, Mark and Berry's in poetry in motion. People tend to say to me, I prefer you on the radio than I do in the television. Now everybody's singing now, and that's because I think they're probably right. It is more my medium than the television, the radio. Who wakes you up each morning when you'd rather stay asleep? The radio show, I would say, is the show for which I have the most innate ability. I've never, never, ever been frightened of a microphone. I've been frightened of a camera. Uh, and I've never doubted my ability. To, to speak into a microphone, and I've always been able to do it. Television took an awful lot longer. And yes, it's fun and a great challenge to do the, the big things particularly. But my first love, my first job was radio. And that's, that's the thing, I think, um, they'll probably have to drag me away from the microphone when they decide to, to elbow me. I should cling to it. There'll be a lot of tears and screaming. I'm going to miss you. Thank you. Thank you for being my friend. Wasn't that a moment? And we've got many of the togs in the audience tonight. Terry's fan base, of course, the glue that held many a radio show together. Now, Marion, just tell me what, why you're all so loyal to the man then. What was it about Terry that you loved? He was just such a wonderful, charming, gentle, generous man with that wonderful voice that you could wake up to. If we could just bottle what he had, we'd all be millionaires. But I think I feel like a millionaire, just for the privilege of having met him and known him. Oh, gosh, it was a fantastic thing to say. <laughs> um, now, you Jill, in a couple of words, what was it for you then about Sir Terry? Just that he supported everything that we did with the Togs in fundraising. He was a mm. really generous man and a lovely man to be in his company. He was funny and, yeah. and welcoming to everyone. And after meeting all of you tonight, you radiate his warmth. It's so <laughs> lovely, such a nice group of people. Christine, can I just squeeze in here? Because, of course, we know he inspired a lot of people, he you did. included, Christine. He, he did. I, for me, he lit up every morning. He, he lit up a room, and I think he lit up all our lives. And, uh, yeah, truly inspiring.
And in terms of inspiration, there was something specific because in there later is. life, yes. you've become a DJ. Yes, I did. When I retired nearly five years ago, I always wanted to, I'd always been musical, always been into music, wanted to learn the processes. I thought I'd be doing it in a room at home quietly. Mm. Went off and did some courses, got the equipment, built up playlists, got a tutor. And then the Togs, thanks to Norman and Helen at one of our conventions that I was going to every year, said, would you DJ for us? Can you imagine? I'd never performed. And the day that I was doing my first performance, I was sitting next to Terry at lunch, which was <gasps> such an honour. No pressure. And Terry said, you're going to be fine, relax, just be yourself. And uh, I said, nobody knows Sir Terry. Well, he then got up and was thanking all the togs and said, and now DJ Dizzy Twilight is going to be your DJ tonight. Dizzy Twilight, because <laughs> he'd come up with these funny names for you. Dizzy well, Twilight is perfect for a DJ, isn't hmm, it? Well, it was in there, but I was very honoured indeed. So what an inspiration. Well, Christine, we have four other people who are quite good over there on the radio. Oh, no. um, <laughs> yeah. You, isn't it, it's just lovely to see the togs because, of course, one of the elements that, that kind of fired the imagination of, of, of so many listeners as well. But this was a thing because so Terry was, was just magical at being able to create this kind of fantasy world with all of these kind of characters and this, that and the other that went along. And obviously, with it being radio, it lent itself to the imagination so much more. So what was it like for you guys to be working within this kind of imaginary fantasy world? With... Well, here's, here's a great example of that. Every November the 5th, we had the silent fireworks, which would happen. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's bad enough, bad enough doing fireworks on the radio, but silent <laughs> fireworks, yeah. because we didn't want to alarm animals no. and children. No. Brilliant. Which is absolutely the right thing to do. So you would have a Roman candle. Look, there's a Roman That's candle. Beautiful. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that would go oh. on throughout the whole yeah. program. Should we let another firework up? Okay, here we go. Here we go. Oh! <laughs> Ooh. Just fantastic. And there was a, a company that supplied empty fireworks yes. actually to have in the studio so that we could... We could, we could, we could yeah. It made sense then, didn't it? It made sense. But there was a real irony as well to him. I mean, what do you think he would make of, of, of all of this, Graham? I mean, you know, all of, all of this admiration mm. that everybody's seeing at the moment because... He's I mean, very self-deprecating, was so wasn't self -deprecating. he? You know? He wasn't very big. I think he, he did know how good he was, though. You could hear yeah. when he when he talked when he in interviews when he was actually actually pinned down to talk about what he did. Mm. He did get it. There was a kind of self analysis that went on yeah. where where he understood. But I'm sure he'd be very sort of embarrassed and nonplussed by this. And it is so weird mm. to, that it, it seems right that we would gather yes. to yeah. sing his yeah. praises and everyone's yeah. here. But it just I I still can't quite believe that. He's not no, here. No, no for sure. We're talking about this without him. Yeah. And the yeah. front page of every newspaper today. Yeah. yeah. It's like a, a you know somebody a minister or, or secretary of state or somebody had died, somebody from the royal family, all that sort of stuff. Somebody not but as was, important. But not as important. Yeah. 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 But actually, yeah, Terry, it was yeah. Terry. But you it just feels wish, right, though, doesn't you just it? wish that he, yeah. you know, he that could see all of this this love. I'm sure, I'm sure he knew. I'm sure he knew. Yeah. But it's just, it just seems. Oh. Anyway, uh, now we've talked a lot about radio, but Sir Terry's television career included Blankety Blank, and for 28 years the Eurovision Song Contest. But it was a show simply called Wogan which brought him regularly into our homes at this very time of night. And there was rarely a dull moment, particularly when certain female guests were sitting opposite him. <laughs> it was a show that went out three nights a week, live. Wogan, you're on, you're on. With a live audience and everyone who is anyone dropping in. The great and the good, the bad and the ugly, they called it Wogan. Nicholas Cage, Harrison Ford, Robert De Niro. Wogan! Oh, Wogan. Terry, um... <laughs> is it Terry? Yes, yes. it is. All right, don't touch me! <laughs> <laughs> it was a risk that not many people will take. It was a risk that, um, at the time, many advised me not to take. Welcome to the beginning of what I hope will be a long and happy relationship. You are live, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Proof? if proof were needed. I wanted to make the interview sparkle. I still think that's the way to do it. I still think you have to have somebody who's, who's able to joust, who is able to exchange. There is this kind of obsession with trying to look younger than you are and, and you eventually... You that was mine. You're speaking about the West Coast. I, you're talking about a sweeping, a sweeping generality. I'm not a sweeping generality. Certainly not. <laughs> Very great things about you yes. from Victoria Principal. She's crazy about you. <laughs> Would you like her? Yes. Okay. 
you like her? I'm not gonna say no if you don't say no. I like whoever you like. <laughs> Didn't you find her a little trampy? <laughs> you haven't read the book, have you? No. Well, you see. <laughs> How can you sit here and have this conversation? With the greatest difficulty. There were women who were so astoundingly beautiful. Oh. You could not possibly do anything but react to them. You were voted the third sexiest lady in the history of the universe. Now, how did you feel about that? It's completely changed my life. What will you do as you, you get older? Will you tone down uh, I'll the I'll do a talk show, I imagine. <laughs> That's all muscle. I don't want to touch it. Did you know what you started when you refused to touch me with a barge pole? Everybody touches my knees ever since. Cheeky. I had a very, very low threshold of embarrassment. And I have. You know, the blush of shame easily mantles my cheek. Were you a virgin when you got married? <laughs> Aren't we all? It's like life. It's going to have it. It's going to have its highs and its lows. Have you been paying any attention to what I've been saying? Of course. <laughs> they don't seem to make any um, concession to the fact that you're a you're a woman, do oh, they? No. Why should they? Why I mean, I don't make any concession to the fact that they're men. No. <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready for this. Ah. While leaving her moaning low, hope I fly, oh, why can't I? Oh, how green shoes! Why to set the night on fire, fire? Shining light on, shining light on, shining light on me. Every evening when the sun goes down, And although we all knew he was, you know, a giant of broadcasting, absolutely brilliant at what he did, but he did like to do it in his very own way. There's no doubt in that. So, Chris, how was it for you, though? Because you did produce him, didn't you, on Terry and Gabby for a little while. Well, I didn't. That's the whole point. I tried. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't really like that. Um, we had a show on Channel 5 called Terry and Gabby, which mm. ran after his daily radio show for a year, and it started at 10. And... Um, Terry finished at half nine, so he had to really whip across there. Mm. And his energy levels were amazing. Because, you know, after you come off the radio, you, you're, pr you're pretty much deflated for a while. You've got a lot of adrenaline's gone through your system and, you know, you've been focusing a lot. And he'd come on the radio, again, come over to the TV show. First thing, nice to everybody again. Um, my assistant now, um, Hitton, uh, the hitman, the frothy coffee man. Frothy coffee. He started on that show as a runner. And he, rem he remembers Terry every morning coming up to him you know, the lowest of the low, with the greatest respect to everybody in TV, and um, and going over to him and making a big <laughs> fuss of him. No, but he says it, you know? Yeah, And no. he, he, he said he made more of a fuss of, you know, the, the, the more insignificant everybody else thought you were, the more significant mm. he made you feel. That kind of thing, do you know what I mean? Mm. And um, we had to write his scripts, you know, so we're writing Terry Wogan's scripts, the most articulate man on TV, without a script. So we're writing these scripts and we're thinking, oh. so we spent ages and ages writing these. Do you know, they, they look like this and they're mm. auto-prompt scripts. So, yeah. And Terry, I mean, he was the king. And I, I know there's a lot of superlatives being used today, but he really was the king of autocue. He could find the intonation in an autocue on first read, because he would never read it beforehand, you no, know that. No, absolutely. <laughs> and he would just read it perfectly. He would make it sound miles better than you ever wrote it. Um, but we did have production meetings, which he was very much averse to, because, you know, it's like Woody Allen. He hires the best actors and then lets them act. He doesn't mm. then tell them how to act, because that's why would he hire them otherwise. Mm. So we, but we did have to have a production meeting for the sake of everybody else mm -hmm. on the show, including mm -hmm. Gabby and the, the director. So, so we just sat Terry down, gave him a cup of tea, and we just sort of assembled around him. Yeah. <laughs> and we sort of had this production meeting sort of without him realising. Yeah, under the guise of tea and biscuits. Mm. Yeah, ho <laughs> yeah, hoping that some of it probably <clears throat> might go in not that it matters and um i remember one one day we put we put some um, some philosophy in there because he because he studied philosophy as mm. a student and so we put some marcus aurelius in there from meditations and i, I thought he'd like this he'd like this and before he got to the lines he'd already read ahead and this is on telly so he's speaking out loud and then he starts giggling he says huh 
we've got some Marcus Aurelius on the way for you. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, how did you read yeah. it that far? And B, you remembered exactly what it was. And, you know, there was no point in toying with him. You know, he came... The best thing to do with Terry was, was make a show as good as you could before he arrived, then leave him to it and let, his, let him sprinkle his magic dust yeah. on it. That used to happen with... Um... With, uh, with Janet and John, he would read slightly further ahead. And that's why he started sniggering before anybody because yeah. sensed yeah, yeah, yeah. there was anything yeah. going to happen. Uh, and that's why we were, we were just in fits of laughter. Mm -hmm. he was, also, he did have the greatest laugh in broadcasting. Yeah, no, he did. He, he set did. everybody up. He did. Him and Peter Alice. You know? Yes. It was like dastardly and muttly. It was just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was exactly. just utterly infectious. And it's yeah. just totally infectious. Yeah. So if you were looking around, if you were driving around uh, the country and looked in other cars, you could see which ones were listening to Wogan. They were the yeah, ones everybody's in laughing fits together. of laughing. Yeah. 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 A lot of people have yeah. been saying that. that you, yeah. you remember yeah. being stuck in traffic and you'd see other people laughing. You just kind look of like, oh, wow, you're all yeah. listening. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we think, Grim, that you're going to like this next little film here because, of course, things didn't always go to plan. Uh, some of Sir Terry's guests were reluctant, they were confused and even... A little bit squiffy. <laughs> it can often be quite embarrassing where the people you've just spoken to refuse to leave the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Although you stand up, here we go. I would prefer to do these things like, prefer to do it warts and all, with the untidy edges showing. Television doesn't have to be honed and polished to a fine glass. When the, the bomb went off, uh, you di I didn't actually feel anything. What I felt was swallowing a lot of heat. <laughs> Hang on. I think somebody's let something off here. Actors have to be given lines, so they do have a bit of a problem on talk shows. I think sometimes if you've got the monosyllabic actor, it was hell on wheels. <laughs> Do you do any of this stuff in America? I mean, do you ever Never. do a talk show? No. Are you glad you did this one? No. <laughs> John, you walked out there to me like, like many actors do on talk shows, with, with your eyes blank, thinking, I've got to ad-lib now for about 16 minutes. Um, does, it, does it intimidate you, this kind of thing? No, no. Would you really. rather not do it? No, it's fine. You seem to play an awful lot of those energetic and uh, slightly loony roles. This is true. Does this reflect? Does this reflect your own sunny personality? <laughs> <laughs> you love doing talk shows, don't you? Oh, it's <laughs> <terrific. laughs> you just interviewed what was put in front of you, <laughs> which is a bit like school dinners. When are we going to get off cooking and talk about my new book? I don't know. Whatever you like. Well, let's do it now. The Duke of Edinburgh scheme become I a... I thought you were going to talk about the carriage driving. Right? Oh, yes, we are. <laughs> oh, yes, we are. <laughs> I know you are enormously popular in England. I'm thrilled to be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> I came on this show to sell a book. If I'm talking to somebody and we get into an embarrassing situation, I want to run away. It'll cost you a Bentley. Do you have a Bentley? No. I don't drive anything. I got banned. Oh, I <laughs> I got him, didn't I? Oh, you are celebrating some kind of anniversary, aren't you? Am I? What, I what am I celebrating? Well, I don't know. It says in the card there that you are. <laughs> <laughs> George Best. And it's at this point I know that George is out of his mind with drink. I keep bringing his manager in. We've got no idea what they're talking about. And what they're... I mean, they talk loaded. Please. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. his life. Oh, well, tis very. Well, almost. <laughs> although he hasn't got a drink with him, and although he's not drinking anymore, he's getting progressively drunker as the interview goes on. <laughs> he's, he panics. I do, yeah. Do, can you see it in my eyes? Yeah. Evil has been in control of the planet for 12,000 years. It has been the dominating force. Was it a great shock for you to discover this at 38? Well, I, th I think the... <laughs> Actually, when I see that again, I'm slightly embarrassed by it. David Icke believes what he believes, however silly we may think it. So I'm delighted that there's so much laughter in the audience tonight. But no, um, it's a... But just let, just let me, just let me say this. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. I shouldn't have done that. I, I'm not proud of that. I always knew when an interview went well and when it didn't, obviously. But you couldn't dwell on it. Better go one, on to another subject, because one, it's not a very good point. One hears these rumours. 
if you mean, do, got... if you mean, do I behave on question time like I behave in private when I'm in discussion with four or five friends, the answer is yes. Why didn't I ask it that way in the first place? <laughs> what did that card say, that bloke? Like that? I, I never mind these people say, what's on that board there? The floor manager going, going back, you know. Well, did you see that? Did the viewers see that? I think they're giving me the wind-up, Wogan. Wow. Well, well, of course, I'll be. We understand the kind of the I mean, joy it of life. Feel a lot better yeah. watching that. But, I mean, well, it Bruce does. Willis seems run of the mill now. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so true. So it's true. Fine. But the thing is, I mean, that was live. He was out there yeah. on his own uh, with a guest, and obviously, you, you know what he feels like there, Grim. When you observe his technique and obviously watching him through the years, what did you learn from him as a as an interviewer? Well, he, what's amazing about him is that nothing really phases him. You can tell you, he's sitting there thinking, "I really wish this were going better," or you know, "We should." say something but there's a kind of a carelessness about us mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. kind of a, all right don't talk or yeah insult me or you know, he just rolled with the punches and and that goes back to that thing about how incredibly relaxed he yes. was yeah. Uh, yeah. at any time and I said and it goes also about the lack of preparation you can only do that if you're quite fluid mm -hmm. and you can move around mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what he was able to do Mm -hmm. We have to talk about the Eurovision handover because his acerbic comments became absolutely, you know, infamous. Um, brilliant. And you took on the mantle as well and kind of took it in the same direction. But how daunting was it for you then, Graham, taking over that big role? It's extraordinary because you forget that actually lots of people have commentated on the Eurovision Song Contest over the years. Mm -hmm. But when he took it, he turned it into a job. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, it had it'd been nothing. Mm -hmm. And for 30 years, he... He absolutely uh, made it his own, and it will always be his. You know, I've said this before, when I'm doing Eurovision, Terry's voice is in my yeah. head. <laughs> yes, I mean, the first yes. time I sat there in Moscow, the first time I, I did, um, when the Eurovision theme came up, it was that awful, oh, I've got to speak. I've got to say <laughs> welcome to viewers in the United Kingdom. And it, it was extraordinary. And when, I, when he'd had enough of Eurovision, when he'd finally sort of, I think, fallen out of love with it and, and, and said no more, and they asked me, of course, I really wanted to do it, yeah. but I didn't want to do it unless... He said it Unless was okay. Had his, yeah, yeah. So messages went back and forth, and I kind of thought, oh, you know. Anyway, it came back. Yes, no, he's very happy that you do it. Now, I didn't know if that was true or not, but well. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to do the job. So yeah, I was like, yeah. okay, yeah, I'm sure he said that. Anyway, a couple of days, be a couple of days before I went uh, off to Moscow, my phone rang, and it was Terry on the phone. Oh, really? Which is, like, so unnecessary. Wow, yes. He yeah. didn't need to do that. Mm. And it was just an incredibly yeah. sweet thing to do. And, you know, he found my number, he called me, and just to say, really, just to say good luck and to say that he'd be watching. And then the only bit of advice he gave me was not to have a drink before song nine. <laughs> and, and so every year, I mean, Terry's in my head the whole way through, but we always think of Terry at song yeah. nine, we, 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 oh. we pull out the cork. So uh, this year, this year, this year, is yeah. Gonna, yeah. This, this year is gonna be so kind of bittersweet. Um, of uh, yeah. Because I think everyone will be thinking about uh, Terry so much. Can you shout yeah. out, yeah. song nine, everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, absolutely, Ab absolutely. <laughs> we, 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 we will. Yeah. Well, Sir so Terry could be fairly scathing about his TV career at times, yes. but one show he would never take the mickey out of was, of course, Children in Need. Yeah, of course, another night that will we'll never be the same again, but with him at the helm, it became a BBC institution that changed thousands of young lives. Sir so Terry was a big part of raising £790 million. <laughs> Now it's time to pay tribute to a very wonderful and warm human being. But enough of me. If there was a good ship for children in need, well, Sir Terry would be the carved figurehead at the front of it. Sir Terry has presented Children in Need for over 30 years. That's over 200 hours of live TV and pure professionalism. Terry Wogan is quintessentially children in need. When you think of children in need, you think of Terry. And the second I started on that show, he took me under his wing and, you know, guided me through the chaos. Quite moved. <laughs> he has got the smoothest voice I think I've ever heard. Imagine a suite with Terry Wogan running all the way through it. Sir Terry Wogan is the linchpin in Pudsey's nappy. Oh. <laughs> He's got great energy. You know, you never see him wavering over the night. Hello, I'm Gabby Roslin. 
No jokes. I really have lost Harry Wogan. You might be off having a little, you know, a little tipple on the side. Thank you very much, Charles. As far as I know, Terry Wogan only ever drank water. Charles, Terry Wogan, £250 pounds for his time. Yeah, the show must go on, you know. It's the old pro syndrome, you know. Bore everybody to death. <laughs> Belting idea. What? Who so just gets dealt curveballs all night? Pretty smooth, eh? <laughs> if you've been watching from the start, and even I haven't been watching from the start. He doesn't have to unwind after he's been on stage. He's relaxed on stage. And that is why he's a great host for the evening. I'm not really with you now. It doesn't matter how chaotic it is, he'll just rock on the balls of his feet and just go, oh. Ah. Mm. Oh. Mm. Just caught a glimpse of myself on the television. How have you been able to watch this? <laughs> Tonight, we can all make it count, really count, for the children. He's passionate about the charity himself. He's passionate about what it stands for. Keep the donations coming in, please. I hate to nag, but we've got to do no, better this do, year. No. All that fine work that contributed to him becoming Sir Terry. Oh, we're glad that you're here. But show us the money. It's Terry's show. Children in need is Terry, and Terry is children in need. Isn't that heartwarming, everybody? He's a legend. He is a legend. He's a legend. Deepest respect for that man. I've always loved him. He is a national treasure. And it's just great to be able to say I worked with Terry Wogan. I just hope when the day comes when I'm not able to react quickly, when <laughs> I appear to trip over my feet, I hope that somebody's going to take me aside and say, Tommy, we're gone. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all your efforts. But in the meantime, I'm going to go on doing it for as long as I can. Oh, very strange. Yeah. Yeah. I love you. I'm going to say that again. £790 million. Pounds. He was such a big part of raising. We're now joined uh, by Sue Cook, who presented Children in Need with uh, Sir Terry. Was it, it was 1984, your first that, Yes, that year was the very the first year. They made it seven hours long. It started right. at seven and went on till two in the morning. So a daunting prospect anyway. Yeah, what anyway. Was, what, what, what was your memories of that year then? With, well, of with course, Sir I was terrified. And, um, yeah, Terry <laughs> of course, was saying. really kind of calm, as usual. And we had a, a run through the night before, which Terry didn't come. To. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I say run through, of course, it was that's a very loose phrase. We yeah, had yeah. a script that yeah. thick, and you looked at it and it said TBA on every page. Oh, like two B. Yeah. So we called it a rumour sheet anyway. But uh, so we didn't really know what was going to happen in the seven hours. And since you couldn't rehearse seven hours anyway, Terry's view was well, we won't rehearse anything Why at all. Bother? Yeah. I'll stay in bed all day and I'll come into the studio about six o'clock. Uh -huh. That's yeah. what he did. Um, but we had, of course, 20 million viewers in those days because there weren't all the TV channels there are now. So you just knew that everybody was watching. Mm -hmm. So it was very frightening. And how did you then, Sue? Because I know from experience, he sat here, Sir Terry, instead of Matt, um, on a couple of occasions. And his timings, well, I mean, they're anybody's guess. But also, it's quite hard <laughs> to get a word in edgeways. Impossible, yes. Um, well, they gave me the, what this, what's called omnibus talkback, which you'll probably know about. You have the earpiece with everything, because we had at least six or eight regions around the UK who were all doing their little bits, the live inserts and so on. Yeah. And we needed to know what cameras were going, what was going to come up next, what had broken down. So I had about seven people's voices in, in my ear. Terry, sensibly, had just one voice, and that was the director. So um, it was my job, as Mrs Sensible from the Current Affairs Department, <laughs> <laughs> to come over and do the sensible bits and mm. introduce the films about where the money went and to make sure that Terry shut his mouth when the, yeah. <laughs> the news was coming mm. up, because he just wouldn't. So I ended up um, you know, going, putting my hand over his face. Once, absolutely, once I absolutely. just went and sat on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> just to shut him up. I always <laughs> had tremendous yeah. respect for Sue, because whenever the going got tough, he would just sit there and go, Sue. <laughs> How harsh is that? It's getting it's 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 very difficult. Yeah. Sue. It was baptism of fire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, of course, oh. everybody's been talking about how much of a great talker he is. But I worked very closely with him for the last few years on the board of trustees with children in need. And what struck me, I'm sure you'd agree here, Chris, is, is how much of a good listener 
he actually is and how he can react to what he's hearing. And I think that really is the key uh, to Terry. And, and you're so passionate at its heart of children in need. And he gave everything that he possibly could with his time and his generosity. And I know that you too have worked incredibly close with him on, on that front. Yeah, I mean, Terry th th thought, thought this business was nonsense. And that's why he was good at it, because he didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, he, he focused on it and he did a very good job. But he still thought at the end of the day it was silly. He, th he thought the world pretty much in general was silly. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that was one of his, um, the secrets of his success. But the thing he did take very seriously uh, was children in need. Yeah. And, and again, you know, the smaller you were, the more he put the magnifying glass over you. And if you needed help. Mm. You know, th that's what it was all about for Terry, yeah. because of certain uh, challenges and situations he's come across in his own life. Mm -hmm. And also, that was the joy of the radio show, because, because there was this underlying, real sort of joy for life, because life is so fragile. Mm. And, um, you know, that, that, that was all part of that sophisticated veneer mm. that came across very simply yes. in the mornings, but actually was so complicated. Yeah. And, and what he was brilliant at was distilling it all and then giving you, giving us the, the fruits of all that Absolutely internal yeah. labour yeah. and all that yeah. conflict. And then he would just go, and here it yeah. is. Just brilliant at taking on board the experiences that he had and, and, and allowing us to share now. Mm. So Terry lived in the UK for most of his life, but he grew up in Limerick and lived uh, for two decades in Dublin. Indeed. So let's go live to Kira Doherty, who's there for us now. So Kira, how is Sir Terry's passing been received then and reported over there in Ireland? Oh, Alex, there's a genuine outpouring of sadness here in Ireland. Notwithstanding the fact that our general election is due to be called tomorrow, every newspaper, every television station, every radio programme has been dominated by Sir Terry's passing. On Ireland AM, the national breakfast programme that I co-present, we were inundated with calls and texts from viewers who wanted to express that sadness, but they really also wanted to talk about the pride that they felt that this Irish emigrant had gone to the UK and had been so successful. And they spoke about the fact that he left at a time uh, of the troubles in the 70s and the 80s when English-Irish relations were quite fractious and when it was perhaps quite a difficult time to be an Irish person in the UK. But because he had such a platform, because he had so many loyal listeners and because he was so loved by UK audiences that he perhaps played a part in changing people's preconceived notions of what an Irish person really was. And in Limerick, uh, where he was born and where he grew up, there's been two books of condolences open today and people have queued all day to sign those books and there is talk of erecting a permanent memorial to Sir Terry in Limerick and those who signed the book today including a 78 year old man who was the first person this morning to sign that book spoke of him as an ambassador uh, as a real asset to Ireland and they said that that self-deprecating sense of humour that you talk about that ability to spin a story and to tell a good yarn well we like to think that those are quite unique Irish qualities and he embodied all those, he embraced all those. So while we were more than happy to share him with you in the UK because he was that person, we really felt that we owned him here in Ireland and we were so glad and so proud today to call him one of our own. He will be fondly remembered and very, very sadly missed. Back to you in London. Aww. Thanks, Kira. Thank you. And Graham, of course, he was a trailblazer for Irish talent, for you yourself. Well, he made it he made it impossible at a time when, you know, Irish people left really to come here to you know, work in the buildings or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, here was this this man. It was Eamon Andrews and him, and then Terry just took off. And he had that thing about how the Irish accent is classless, because you are those that would be a disadvantage here. Mm -hmm. And he was the first person I ever heard speaking about how yeah, it was just... an advantage to be an Irish person here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He made it possible for everybody with a regional accent, really, didn't he? You yeah. know, he brought it to the fore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's stay on that side Come of on, the Irish Sea and Come on, enjoy <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy Sir Terry reconnecting with his homeland and reminiscing about his upbringing. Wake up to Wogan on Radio 2. And this is it then. This is the day I've been dreading. The inevitable morning when you and I come to the parting of the ways. After 40 years of talking to myself and to you, the loyal listener, I gave up the day job. And now I'm heading off to rediscover the country that made me. We're about to arrive in Limerick. 
This is where I was born, where I lived until I was 15. I'm coming home. Apart from being my birthplace, Limerick's other claim to fame is that it lies on the mighty Shannon, the longest river in the British Isles, running as it does all the way up to the border with Northern Ireland. At Sarsfield Bridge, I cycled back and forth over that bridge every day, traveling from home to school and back again. And now, as a freeman of the city, I can drive a herd of sheep over the selfsame bridge. And this was the school, Crescent College, run by the Jesuit fathers. The building's still standing. Hope the same can be said of my old school friends. Look, look, look at the boys, look. I thought you'd be running to us, kind of with open arms. I've just had my knee replaced. I say, Sebastian, I haven't seen you for years. How are you, <laughs> They're Jim Sexton, <laughs> Bobby Mulrooney and Mick Leahy. How are you getting on? <laughs> I'm carrying on. The building is still used as a school, so I hope it hasn't changed too much. I haven't been through these doors in 60 years. No, that was before us. Ah, oh, no, I remember that. Crescent College was run on a diet of study, rugby, prayer and punishment. And this old staircase here takes me straight back to the person that dished out the punishment. And am I right in thinking that Snitch McLaughlin used to stand up at the very top there? Yes. He was, he was what, Jim? What did we call he him? He was the prefect of studies. He goes, stand here. Yeah. His real name was Jerry McLaughlin. He was a northerner. That's right. Was he? he was, yeah. And he was a man of severe aspect. He was. He, he was very strict. And as you quite rightly say, we were all in a certain terror of him. Yeah. Remember, you got, you got a docket when you were punished for not knowing something. Your teacher wrote out a little docket. Six and the best. It. Had the whole morning yeah. or afternoon to think about it. Sure. And he's about gonna, he was the, he was you, the executioner. You, this yeah. is where you used to go to get your hands knocked off. Correct. My screams could be heard all the way down O'Connell Street. We're coming down onto uh, O'Connell Street now, uh, you see? That's and right. We'll, uh, there's Lee. You see that? See that thing on, uh, on the corner? That's the farmer's old That's shop. That's the Dar's old grocery store there. It is, yeah. It's now a clothing store, but if you look very carefully at this rare old photograph, you'll see Leverett and Fry on the far right. So this is where it was. Do you remember? The Dar used to carve the ham around about here. That's right. Yeah. But he, when you think about it, he was handling all this exotic uh, foodstuffs. Yeah. And he was actually an expert in meats and the cooking of meats and hams and stuff like that. And my dear mother, God rest her soul, was the great destroyer of meat. She was. She did the incineration technique of cooking. Auntie you know? May used to say, uh, Rose couldn't boil water. That's right. <laughs> That's my mother, That's right. Rose. Now the moment I've been waiting for, Elm Park is where Brian and I were born where we spent our childhood. And for the first time since we left Limerick over a half a century ago, we're going home. 18 Ellen Park, Limerick, eh? That's it. Look at it. In this very bathroom, Michael Wogan used to sing every evening as he shaved. He used to sing songs like Dead for Bread and Valentine's Goodbye to Faust. That's right. And he used to... He used to deafen everybody within a radius of 100 metres. <laughs> but he always shaved the night before. Meticulous man. And I learned the floral dance because in this very bathroom, he used to sing it here. That's right. Michael Wogan. The hero's echoing. Baritone extraordinary. Each one making the most of his chance All together in the floral dance. After driving nearly 2,000 kilometres around the old Emerald Isle, I'm back in Dublin. When I was 15, one hour ahead of the posse, we Wogans moved here from Limerick, where I'd spent my childhood. Twelve years later, I made Helen Joyce the happiest woman in the planet by marrying her. My life... If you're asking me about my life and the meaning of my life, it's been absolutely wonderful. I've had the most wonderful time. Uh, I've had a lovely family. I've had a loving wife. I've had success in the material world. I've done something I wanted to do. I've had an ideal life. So I can only tell you what it means to me, which is happiness. 
I said, our thoughts are with Sir Terry's family. And Mark, his son, has sent a letter to you, Chris, that he wanted yeah. you to read on the show tonight. Yeah, he said yeah? this just before the show, um, just before he came on the air. Everybody's reaction has been amazing and lovely today. If you could deliver the following words on our behalf, we would be most appreciative. Um, I and the rest of the family would like to keep our grief private for now. We as a family, though, are overwhelmed by and grateful for the love and support displayed for our beloved husband, father and grandfather. He would have been embarrassed by all the fuss, but we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Well... What we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna finish with a little bit of music this evening, and it's because the thing is that Sir Terry wasn't just a broadcaster, uh, he was also, very briefly, uh, a pop star. It's true. <laughs> In 1978, after entering listeners with his own rendition, after entertaining listeners with his own rendition of the floral dance, mm. he released the track by popular demand and even appeared on Top of the Pops. Yes, he released the single uh, with the Brick House and Rastrick Band, who are going to be playing us out uh, very shortly. They're behind us. Uh, Standing Derek by. is here. He's, he's, he's been reunited. I'm so pleased you did this because the last time you did this was 1978, wasn't it? For This Is Your Life, isn't it, That's Terry? correct, yeah. Wonderful. Well, listen, <laughs> we'll let you get prepped. Uh, keep your hands warm because it's about to happen very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's all, though, we do have time for for tonight. Thank you so much to Chris, to Graham, to Alan, to Sue and to Lynn. And our thoughts, as we said, are with Sir Terry's wife, Helen, and children, Alan, Mark and Catherine. Thanks to everyone as well who sent in their photos of them with Sir Terry. Keep an eye out because they'll be coming up very shortly. Yes, we'll show them while we uh, hear the music here. Now, tomorrow we're going to be live from Hebden Bridge uh, where the flooded shoulder of Mutton Pub will become our studio for the night. But we will leave you with two thoughts from Sir Terry. Time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. Yes, <laughs> and his golden rule of broadcasting was uh, get on your toes, Keep your wits about you. Say goodnight politely when it's over. Go home and enjoy your dinner. Mm. Well, on that note, playing us out, it is the Brig House and Rastrick Band with the Floral Dance. Good, Good night. night. Thank you. Good night.